<clears throat> Hello. Um, again, uh, today is uh, October 7th, uh, 2023, and uh, we have uh, on this day, um, it is Saturday uh, festival, uh, Le Corbusier, uh, through which we, we pay homage to this um, uh, complex uh, architect uh, whose birthday was yesterday. <clears throat> so now we'll talk about uh, Le, Cor Le Corbusier and God meaning building, building for God. And we'll start with uh, <clears throat> the chapel Notre Dame du Haut in Ranchamp in France, which everybody, which is very well known. And uh, <clears throat> we'll, we'll try to say a few things about it, which maybe are not um, often, uh, uh, you know, written about or uh, commented. Uh, <clears throat> I, I, I visited the building and um, with some with some uh, pain because I had to take twice the train from Paris to Ronchamp. Um, I, I didn't meet very kind people there uh, and uh, to direct me to the site of the of the chapel. In the end, I, I saw it, and it is a, <clears throat> it is a, <clears throat> it is a little bit. Uh, uh, disappointing the fact that there is an airport not far away from uh, from the chapel and so the planes fly uh, not uh, sufficiently far away from uh, uh, from it uh, and so there is a noise which is not quite uh, uh, sacred <clears throat> plus when i when i visited the building it was um, uh, it looked like it was uh, freshly uh, repainted or refurbished, and it was uh, uh, a little bit, for my taste, a little bit too uh, too clean and uh, and too object-like. This is what uh, what uh, this was what I felt when I went there. Uh, <clears throat> otherwise, of course, uh, but but on the other hand, you know, it's known that when you go to a destination which has a lot of uh, publicity, you go to a place where. You don't expect you. You expect uh, um, you know. You you expect uh, in a way more than uh, you can get. You know, we, we we have a saying in this country: don't go to the uh, praised um, uh, tree with a with a with a sack with a big uh, container. Uh, you know, meaning don't 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 have expectations beyond a certain limit. It is a it is a good building, but um, uh, I don't know. I, I uh, to be honest with you, I felt a uh, uh, more intense uh, uh, feeling of uh, I felt more intensely about the um, you know the religious space per se at, at La Tourette, and we are going to see in detail La Tourette here as well than at Ronchamp. But the Rochon yes, it is um, you know spectacular, uh, and um, what can we say? You know, it's 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 a building which could have been uh, uh, unborn because, as I mentioned um, in the in the morning of today, uh, initially from what I read, Le Corbusier didn't want to 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 get involved. And uh, in the end, he accepted the, the challenge from, uh, um, I think, from uh, the monk Couturier, a friend of artists, modern artists, and uh, perhaps uh, his friend as well. He accepted the, the challenge, and then he did La Tourette. But I think, I think Le Corbusier wasn't quite a, a religious man. And I think uh, his uh, faith, uh, had some limits, so to speak. I, 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 I'm inclined to think that he was somehow closer to atheism, but I don't have a, a certitude in this field. I base my uh, my statement on uh, because I did do some research, and I uh, I discovered only one uh, so-called palpable proof of his. Uh, uh, you know, uh, system of belief. I saw in a picture in an apartment somewhere where, where he lived um, uh, some kind of a religious uh, painting 
uh, hanging above the headboard of his bed. But that so-called religious painting was eclectic and uh, it, didn't, uh, it didn't generate in me a conviction that he was an ardent uh, believer. Uh, but I'm sure he was a believer in nature and in this respect, he probably was not very dissimilar from uh, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, who at eight, around 85 or so, he was asked in an interview, do you believe in God? And Frank Lloyd Wright said, I do, but I spell it nature. I don't know if Le Corbusier would have, <clears throat> would have, would have answered the same question in identical terms. But I imagine he would have said that he also believes in nature. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> as I mentioned uh, in, in the earlier, <clears throat> what intrigues me the most in this chapel is this southern wall oriented towards south with these windows, uh, which are, uh, <clears throat> I would call them, um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, my voice is, um, is, uh, is not quite happy, I think, with uh, the challenge to talk for 10 hours today as I planned. Uh, anyway, I hope it will do what it is supposed to do. These windows, uh, which have inscriptions uh, of, of uh, Le Corbusier, uh, there are, it, it, it is an imagined dialogue between him and Marie. Marie being, of course, uh, Christ's mother, no? the mother of Jesus. But when I went there, I, I had the feeling that, it, that the, the, the wording, the words that he chose to have the dialogue with Marie, the mother of Jesus, were a little bit too familiar and too intimate. This is what I felt when I was there. I was a little bit surprised that, uh, you know, a mortal would talk like this with the mother of Jesus. And many years later, I read that um, there are people who think that this chapel was not built only for the mother of Jesus, but also for the mother of the architect, whose name is also was also Marie. So it's in a way a chapel built for two ladies, the mother of Jesus and the mother of the architect. And this could explain that feeling, of course, a subjective feeling I had then when I was inside the chapel and I was reading the, the few words that he wrote in this imagined dialogue with uh, um, Notre Dame du with, uh, with 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 uh, Jesus mother but another thing is that <clears throat> and it is related to what i already said is the the unexpected uh, 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 thickness of this wall <clears throat> which is a, a fortress wall and is the only wall in this chapel that is like this. And this wall is oriented towards the sun, S-O-N, the sun, which pierces it through these windows. And I ask myself, why would he oppose to the sun such a thick fortress-like wall? There must be a reason for this, especially when you consider, and we are going to see the plan, that all the other walls are not like this. This is the only one. And uh, I have my own uh, theory. I uh, mentioned it in, in, in the morning. Uh, I don't know if I'm correct. I'm an amateur psychoanalyst at best, but I, this is my theory. And again, I apologize if I am wrong. If this building was built for Marie, the mother of Christ, and Marie, the mother of Le Corbusier, because he adored his mother and all his life he wanted the attention of his mother. Uh, in a way, all his oeuvre is the result of the frustrations he had because his mother apparently loved more his brother than him. So, you know, in his attempt to, to, to uh, soften uh, his mother's uh, attitude towards him, he created what he created. We do know he adored his mother. So if this building was built unconsciously, perhaps, you know, unconsciously towards his mother as well, then we could, uh, towards whom he had the greatest um, 
uh, affection, we could imagine that perhaps this wall acts like some kind of a restrictive uh, device to separate the sun, in this case, S-U-N, not S-O-N, S-U-N, the sun, Le Corbusier, from the mother. Maybe also expressing uh, factuality. I don't know, but in uh, uh, deeper terms or uh, psycho psychoanalytical terms, uh, it could be seen in a different way as well, that the son desired the mother. I, I'm, I'm now venturing on a slippery uh, uh, terrain or road, uh, uh, you know, Freudian, that is, the son desires the mother, but he knows that that the desire is illegitimate, so he builds a very thick wall, a fortress wall between them. And the fortress wall, yes, is pierced because the light of the sun, S-O-N, and the desire of the sun, S-U-N, is still there and is still powerful. And so we have this situation where we have the, you know, the, the two ladies, the two Maries, and then we have the two sons. Sons, S O N and S U N, but S O N meaning uh, the sun that gives light, the giver of life, could be symbolized or, or, or related to Christ as well. So outside of the building, shining Christ and Le Corbusier, inside the building, the two Maries. This is in short and imperfectly exposed uh, my theory. Uh, but you know, returning to the building, you all know it. It's a very famous building, one of the most famous buildings in the world. Um, I don't know what I could add to, um, you know, what you already know, except that, uh, you know, this very window where I put my uh, the arrow of my mouth was broken some years ago. Someone broke it and entered the, the chapel to steal some things. And, and, and this window represents a moon. Uh, I, I don't know if there is, uh, you know, if the thief um, chose a particular window, but he broke that window. I'm sure it was restored. Um, there is someone, at least someone, who thinks that in, in, in creating this building, apparently, uh, Yanis Xenakis um, might have had a role somehow, although I, I'm not sure about this, but I, I did see a vignette uh, about this with two circles interlocked, you know, like uh, um, there is that famous uh, detail in, uh, in the Brion Cemetery by uh, Carlos Scarpa, and uh, one circle was named uh, Le Corbusier, the other circle Yanis Xenakis, and the uh, space of their overlapping uh, was called Ronchamp, as if the implication, uh, graphic implication and the, uh, you know, the wording also implied that uh, from the meeting between Le Corbusier and Yanis Xenakis, Ronchamp was born. Maybe that could be said more about um, uh, La Tourette, but Yes, there is such a material on the web somewhere. I don't have it here, though. I, I have it in, 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 in another presentation. The building is, uh, is, is, very, well, uh, is very well designed. And uh, um, uh, what else can we say? You know, it's, but <clears throat> I, I would say that uh, when I visited La Tourette, and we are going to see it later, I felt greater emotion in the liturgical space than in, uh, in, in at Ronchamp. Although that space is not spectacular in a sculptural sense because it's just a rectangular room. But that rectangular room somehow moved me more, uh, um, you know, uh, architecturally and uh, also uh, spiritually somehow. I, you know, things are so subjective. It depends also when you visit a, a building, uh, one, one, uh, one day you could feel in a certain way and another day you could feel in some other way. But here you see clearly in the plan 
that that wall oriented towards the south is uh, uh, surprisingly and unnaturally very, very thick. Although it, it gets narrower uh, or thinner towards the top, but still is uh, that, that wall, the symbolism of that wall, I don't know if it was written about, but I, I think uh, some kind of uh, study should be made about it because it's it's probably one of the thickest walls in modern architecture. Well, it is pierced, but you see almost unwillingly it is pierced. It, it, there are windows, uh, fortress windows, medieval windows there. And you see all the other walls are not like this. It's just that one oriented towards the south. It's like a shield protect, uh, protecting what is inside the chapel. I would say the two Maries, who else? I, I, I'm not sure if it can, can be explained this situation exclusively in, uh, I don't know, functional or utilitarian terms or even architectural terms. I mean, who taught this man architecture, you know? <laughs> how, how did he make this building? You know, I mean, obviously it's possible to do architecture without any training. And uh, this is not the only building, of course, that he did. It's a clear case of being born an architect. I remember, um, by the way, of this uh, the stenogram of a, a judicial uh, uh, procedure against uh, uh, Joseph Brodsky, the, the youngest uh, poet ever until some years ago. I don't know. I didn't. Uh, uh, I didn't uh, check on this for some years, but until uh, some years ago, he was the youngest poet to receive the Nobel Prize for Poetry, Russian, Joseph Brodsky. And when he was young, like, I don't know, 18, 19, he was not working. And, uh, you know, he was kind of like a dandy in St. Petersburg. He was reading poetry, he was reading philosophy, he was uh, translating, and he was... Uh, uh, caught by the police, uh, uh, by the militia, you know, that uh, he's a parasite and uh, thus, uh, uh, you know, under the Soviet rule, he had to be sent maybe to Siberia or somewhere, being uh, the enemy of the people, the enemy of, um, of uh, the Soviet ideals, being a bourgeois parasite. So there is the stenogram of the dialogue between Joseph Brodsky and the judge. And the judge asks him, what do you do uh, during? He says, uh, he said, I write poetry. He said, who gave you, the, the judge asked him, who gave you the right to write poetry? He said, nobody. Where did you study poetry? He said, I didn't study it. Then how dare you write poetry? Who gave you the right to write poetry? Again, the judge asked. And Joseph Brodsky, I thought it came from God. A great answer and a sincere answer. A poet doesn't need to, to, you know, to get a degree in writing poetry from anybody. If the poet is born a poet, it comes from God. Well, it's the same thing with Le Corbusier. Uh, he, he was born an architect. What can you do about it? You know, God made him an architect. That's what it was. He suffered, of course, because in order to... Uh, become legitimate in the, in the eyes of, uh, you know, the other architects and the world, he had to struggle. It was not easy. You know, I mean, how could you say or even think that God made you an architect? You know, it's uh, ironical and, and, and deplorable and sad that this, in one of the most important architects uh, of the world ever, uh, he had to be humiliated at, at the frontiers, um, you know, on airports and so on. When he was asked what his profession was, he had to say, I'm a on the letter, you know. He, he couldn't say I'm an architect because, uh, you know, 
for bureaucratic reasons, he was not. I mean, even a doctoral student uh, here in, uh, in Bucharest told me, you know, uh, he was not an architect. Le Corbusier was not an architect. That's what a little uh, doctoral student thought. What can we say? It's ridiculous. It's like saying Joseph Brodsky was not a poet because he didn't study poetry in the university. It's ridiculous. What about the builders of the Chartres Cathedral? Were they architects or not? Of course they were magnificent architects and we don't even know their names. And of course they didn't study in any school, but they, uh, it's true, they were part of guilds and uh, they had uh, sophisticated knowledge and so on. But I, I do think Le Corbusier was right. Architecture is not a profession, it's a state of mind. And if you are intoxicated with the beauty and the, the warmth, the, the passion of that, uh, uh, you know, state of mind, uh, you cannot do anything else but architecture. It's like a good poet. You have to write poetry even if you don't have anything to eat. There is no choice. Because literally it comes from God. God is telling you right now. Or if you are Vincent van Gogh, paint now. You have to paint. And you paint, even if you owe with your last money, you buy colors and, and, and brushes and not food. Or in the case of Erasmus of Rotterdam, he said, when I have a little bit of money, I buy books. And if something remains unspent, I buy food. Well, you know, most people certainly would not do it this way. You know, they first buy food and if some money remains, maybe, maybe after they buy some gadgets or clothes or who knows what, they might buy a book or two. But Erasmus of Rotterdam bought first the books. Why? Because of an uh, unstoppable desire for knowledge, curiosity, an intoxicating curiosity. Well, it's the same with Le Corbusier. He had an intoxication with architecture. He was intoxicated by birth with the demon of architecture or the angel of architecture, if you want. He was not the only one, of course, but he, he was one of the very few. He paid for this great gift because great gifts are paid usually heavily. They don't come, come, uh, come easily. Anyway, it is a great building, uh, despite my... Uh, uh, you know, feeling that it was a little bit too clean when I visited it and, uh, um, you know, uh, here you see in this picture the addition of uh, uh, Renzo Piano for tourists, accommodations for tourists, but this building for the monks was built by uh, Le Corbusier and there is a, another little one around here. There is also, I hope we see it, a strange, maybe not so strange, a little um, uh, inverted uh, ziggurat. These are the, we are going to see it. They, these are the, the windows, the stained glass windows with the notations of uh, Le Corbusier towards Marie. I like the way the, the, the roofing floats above the walls. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a touch of... Uh, of sat subtleness and sensitivity there because essentially any chapel or any church and any cathedral should um, elevate you from the terrestrial towards the celestial. There are also, uh, uh, you know, um, all kinds of uh, studies that say that he was influenced, I don't, I don't know, uh, about, by, the, by a shell, which is um, uh, shown here. The shell has been put on walls, which are uh, uh, absurdly, but uh, practically uh, thick. It's true, there are parts where the shell is uh, included in the, I don't know why whoever wrote here absurdly. Um, inside then, however, are reinforced concrete columns. Okay, the shell will rest on these columns but it will not touch the wall, a horizontal crack of light. Interesting wording, crack of light. Uh, I can't read, it's too small. And my eyeglasses are not good. 
this is a magnificent, uh, you know, uh, uh, place where light comes from above and uh, metamorphosizes the, the space. In, in this, you know, very, very poetical and, and yet, I mean, in a, in, a, in a warm, but also austere way. Because faith should be like this, probably. A certain austerity, it's possible that uh, shouldn't be avoided inside the church uh, and inside the chapel and inside the cathedral. In fact, cathedrals, I think, uh, and chapels too. I think they would benefit. They would benefit if that if there was no seating at all. But then, what do you do with tired uh, uh, with tired people? But at least here, you know, there are some benches. But then also, there is also an ample space which has no chairs or no and uh, no benches. One could ask. I I would say, you know, is it legitimate to to sit in front of God, in front of God. What I admire, though, here, and I do have to say, it, this marriage between um, the religious community, you now the those who commissioned Le Corbusier and the modern artist or the modern architect. You know, this conjunction between a creativity which is non-conventional and a religion which has its own dogmas and its own, its own rules, but welcomes also creativity. And un unfortunately, uh, in our country here, we cannot say the same thing. Our country doesn't understand, the religion of my country doesn't understand that if you are made resembling God, and if God was and is creative, man should be creative as well. We don't seem to understand this, and it's tragic. Uh, personally, personally, I think is to build a church in a way which is not creative is to insult God. That's how I would put it abruptly. If you and if you don't try to be as creative as I am. I like to think that God thinks, then you insult me with your mediocre work. But this is what the church here doesn't understand. They think that if they repeat the same building ad infinitum without any nuance, without subtleties, without uh, modernity, without uh, originality, uh, they serve God. They don't. They don't. Because the house of God is the house of exceptionalism. You know, it, it cannot be like any like the other buildings, and and it cannot repeat itself. It has to have. It, it has to be a, an original creation, uh, because it's immensely uh, difficult to generate. You know, the house of God, which a chapel should be, and the church should be, and the cathedral should be. And that's why a, a responsible and educated church employs the best architects and artists available in order to build the houses of God. But not in our country. We don't even know who builds the big cathedral in Bucharest at this moment. It's unbelievable. Anyway, this window was broken apparently by, by someone who wanted to steal probably the genius of the building. What else to, to steal? How could one steal from a church? Anyway, unafraid that God will see him. Because it was probably a him, not a her. Uh, now imagine planes flying above uh, uh, the chapel of Notre Dame du Haut. And there are plenty. Well, not so plenty, but, but they are so close because the airport is close. If you want to make a trip to Ronchamp, I suggest you don't go to Paris as I did and then take the train from there or a plane if you have, uh, you know, if, if you can find a plane. I doubt it. I don't think Ronchamp has uh, an airport. 
But the best way is from Milan, via Milan. You go to Milan in Italy and from there you cross into France uh, because it's, it's close to the frontier with Italy and uh, it's it's easier to arrive uh, in Ronchamp. I discovered um, after I went there. Marie, brillant comme le soleil. <laughs> and there is a sketch actually representing his mother with the sun on the sky. And we saw it in, in you know earlier. So again, we can uh, debate a little bit, you know, which Marie. It's probably both. The mother of Christ and the mother of the architect. Both brilliant as the suns, as the sun. It's hard for me to believe that when he wrote Marie on this window, he didn't also think or realize that his mother's name was also Marie. The moon, that's the window that was broken and restored, I am sure. He created, of course, the, the artworks. This is a very fine uh, stair uh, outside of the building on the northern side. I uh, hope to have other images of it. Um, I like the way he places, the, although a little bit uh, dangerously, he places the, the handrail only on one side of the stair. And you see on the first ramp, it's placed uh, on the left towards the wall where you might, not, you might not have needed one, but not towards the outside. And then the second one has it on the, on, on, on the outside. Uh, there is a case in India, and we are going to see it in the presentation about the works of Le Corbusier in India, where he himself became afraid because uh, he didn't use a, a handrail on one side of the, uh, of the stair. Uh, in fact, we are going to see a rather funny picture where he himself, the architect, walks up on the stair rather careful, cautious, with Doshi behind him, ready to help in case there was the need. Everything is a creation here, everything, you know, as it should be. It's an act of love and an act of, uh, you know, uh, giving birth to a building. But this building is not by Le Corbusier, it was actually built in Mexico. And uh, I think it's, it's kind of obvious that it was inspired by Ronchamp, but it's not a bad building, I think. And nor is Mexico that country of uh, destitute people uh, Donald Trump thought Mexico is. It's not so at all. They have some very good architecture. They even had a, you know, a Pritzker Prize through Luis Barragan they have other important architects and look at this building. Um, it's not bad. I, I would almost say it's better than, uh, you know, the church of the millennium built by Richard Meyer in Rome. Back to Ronchamp. Now, again, who would imagine such a color in a church or a chapel? Maybe Luis Barragan, since I mentioned Luis Barragan, but under a different sun. Well, it's the same sun, S-O-N, but uh, uh, no, S-U-N, sorry, but, uh, you know, a, a hotter sun, a warmer sun in Mexico. And here is the ziggurat. 
Actually, I was wrong when I when I said it was inverted. It is inverted at Saint Pierre de Firminiver, and we are going to see here it is not inverted at all, and uh, it looks. I don't know. I mean, I imagine you sit on these steps and you look at the building, but uh, it's still uh, considering the history of the, you know, this, uh, you know, kind of stepped pyramid, small pyramid. Um, because of its historicism, as opposed to the chapel of, uh, of uh, you know, the chapel itself, which doesn't have historical precedence, the, that, uh, you know, uh, structure, that uh, stepped uh, pyramid uh, uh, or, uh, you know, small ziggurat uh, does have. You see here the, the stairs with a with a, with a handrail on, on, on the left, the first uh, flight, and then the second one has it on the right. Um, I don't think Le Corbusier was comfortable with the idea to, to place two, uh, two parapets. For some reason, uh, he, he indulged in liking uh, a, little bit, uh, a little bit of danger, so to speak, the danger, the danger of falling. An image from the construction that they didn't use a very sophisticated, uh, you know, method of building it. But you know, you can build a, a great building with, uh, you know, uh, you don't need, uh, you know, the latest uh, technology. I would, I would venture to say that uh, some influence from Ronchamp would, uh, would also be seen a little bit, uh, or maybe more than a little bit in Bucharest, the National Theatre. Echoes from Ronchamp. He doesn't have the, the organicism of, of the chapel by Le Corbusier, but uh, uh, some influence was there. Now, the uh, La Tourette Monastery, which I also visited, uh, it's, it's a building which at first I, 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 was, I wasn't very impressed with it, but the more time passes, the more somehow I like it. it it's, it's almost, I could almost say an industrial or pro proletarian monastery. You know, it has this feeling of a, almost a, an industrial building, maybe because of the you know, the roughness, the, you know, the exposed concrete, the, there, is a, there is a level of uh, uh, rawness, R-A-W. The monks are buried uh, not far away to the left here. Uh, there is a mound. Uh, uh, I rented for one night one of the rooms, not on this side of the building, so I slept one night in this building. Anyone who visits it, visits it and it's, it's, it's very easy to arrive, it, arrive at it because you go to Lyon and from Lyon you can visit uh, this important building by Le Corbusier. You can also visit Firmini Ver, which has four buildings by Le Corbusier, a cultural center, a stadium, uh, unité d'habitation plus Saint-Pierre de Firmini Ver. And then, of course, you see in Lyon some very interesting and challenging buildings. So that's a, 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 an important, uh, um, you know, uh, destination for <clears throat> for architects. Lyon, um, and, and this is <clears throat> this is the the plan of the of the of the monastery. This is the you know, where the liturgical service takes place. Number 11, the church itself. Now, if you compare this to uh, Ranchamp, you will say this building cannot be, this, this, you know, rectangular building, this prism, this box cannot be, cannot compare itself with, uh, <coughs> with, with Ranchamp. <coughs> but the truth of the matter is when I was there inside, uh, my emotions were more intense than at Ronchamp. <clears throat> so it doesn't matter actually if you use rectangularity, you can, because of proportions, materials, the whole configuration of the space, you could achieve a um, uh, high level of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, 
emotions and feelings, it doesn't have to be necessarily, uh, you know, a flowing room or, uh, you know, a very agitated form or anything. The entrance is through here, and then here there are, um, you know, uh, small rooms for, for the monks and visitors. You can rent a room here. This is the public bathroom. I mean, you know, the bathroom of the monastery. And I have to say, I, I did take a shower here and I was very, very impressed. In fact, I never, I was never impressed in, in a bathroom. Doesn't matter, you know, public or, or, or private. But here, and I, <clears throat> I cannot explain it because it was nothing, you know, it was nothing uh, luxurious. It was nothing, uh, you know, uh, designed or over-designed. It was so natural that I thought that, you know, even if I didn't see, if I was blind, if I couldn't see, I could, I would have known where to hang my towel or it was all, I don't know, I, I almost feel like going back to, to, to La Touré just to, just to go again to that bathroom. Very modest, very, very modest, very functional and very sensitive at the same time. Everything exposed, you know, the, 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 the pipe that brought uh, cold water one color, the, the other pipe that brought uh, warm water another color, but I don't do justice to it because as a whole, my experience was magical there and I don't know why. I never had, you know, uh, um, even the tendency to dream in a bathroom in this way, but there... It was something magical, and I, I, I think it was, it was simply the, you know, to do the right thing. I don't know how else to explain. Here there is another. It's a, it's a little chapel, uh, this one here, number seven, and um, uh, what can we say? Um, they have here underneath this uh, part of the monastery the. Um, the eating place, you know, where where uh, the monks uh, gather and uh, you can eat if you go there as a tourist. Uh, you can actually dine together with uh, you see here the the tables and the benches. You can you can uh, dine with uh, with uh, with the monks. But the most fascinating uh, part of this uh, building is is the church. Is unbelievable. What I felt there, I never felt in a church. Maybe at Chartres, which is a cathedral and a very different building altogether. But if you look at this, uh, you know, this uh, rectangle, you'd say, what's so special? I don't know. It, the proportions, the feeling, the... I don't know. I don't know. Maybe the voidness itself, which is because of the dimensions. I don't know. I, I think when he created this church at La Tourette, um, Le Corbusier, I don't if he if 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 he were, ever was an atheist, I don't think then he was. Uh, look at look at the section. Now it's possible the section seems to be almost uh, the you know to have the golden uh, ratio. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what it was. It, it, it truly uh, was was a magnificent experience I had. Uh, look at these uh, bizarre, uh, ar this bizarre arcade, these arches, which seem to be done either by a drunken person or by a child, very unexpectedly. And we, I'm going to show pictures as well. Who would expect something like this? And why did he do them this way? Well, you know, here, for example, you could say, okay, it's perpendicular on the sloping land. But what about here, where they are not at all perpendicular on the sloping land? So aren't, aren't they surprising? I think they are very surprising. Here is the chapel that I mentioned. Um, now look at them here. Why did he do them like this? That, you know... Most people would say they are so unskillfully done. It's like the, the work of, a, as I said, or a drunken person or a, a, you know, or a child. Well, it's the work of Le Corbusier. 
In this particular work, Yanis Xenakis had a major role. He was a project manager. He contributed also in terms of design. So Yanis Xenakis, but I don't think he did these, uh, um, you know, very curious arches. It's also not built very well because I saw in one place um, there was a hole in the ground where the foundation was just, uh, you know, near the, the wall, the exterior wall. There was a hole there that I was able to see actually the foundation. I, I, it was not built uh, very, um, certainly not very professionally, not respecting the, you know, the, the customs of, a, you know, so-called classical architect. No, not at all. But it is a fortress of spirit. It, it does have power. Is um, is um, uh, I don't know. It's something which I'm beginning to like more and more about it. Exactly because it doesn't look like uh, you know uh, a place uh, for uh, you know uh, worshiping or for uh, no. It, it it's it's a communal. It's it's a, it's a it's a it's a place for a, a group of people who live uh, in very modest circumstances and uh, their main goal is uh, is uh, illustrated in the in the big uh, rectangular space of the church yeah this is this is the church but of course it has varied it. But do you see any plaster, any kind of softening of the walls? And no, of course not. And and of course we can learn from Le Corbusier and we can learn from other great architects that, you know, truth doesn't need embellishments. You know, you can leave the exposed, you see how the world, the world was built. It's exposed concrete and it's left like this and it's just fine. I mean, whatever some people might say, it's just fine. Because spirit needs austerity, not uh, uh, you know, the caresses of the pleasure principle. It needs austerity. So somebody wrote, maybe a student, I found this table, St. Saint, Saint Maria, St. Saint Mary La Tourette, this one is also dedicated to, to Maria, to Mary, uh, for Saint Mary. It's a study of dualistic relationships. Didn't I mention that Le Corbusier, uh, you know, if I am to express myself in the language of today, probably had some kind of a bipolar disorder. Uh, individual collective, incremental, continuous, secular, re religious, light, dark nature, architecture, high, low, irrational, rational, lucid, obscure, individual, collective. Well, <laughs> you know, this individual collective appears twice. But yes, it, it is a play on uh, dualities and uh, an attempt towards uh, uniting the opposites. And I don't think it's an accident that this particular architect was was born in October, which is the Libra uh, zodiacal sign, and which has a built-in duality. You now, after all, it's about balance, about the Libra, which has two two plates, two sides. Here, also the the roof, the slab above is um, is elevated a little bit from the walls. Excellent, uh, excellent space, excellent, uh, excellent everything there, really. I like to imagine that the monks living here and serving here are truly imbued with a, with a deep feeling towards what they are doing and towards what they are, or who they are worshipping.
But you have you have to be there. These are just photographs. You do have to be there in order to to feel the force of this of this space. So as I said, and I show is this space here. Uh, these booths are for the tourists, you know, the information, you enter through here, and if you rent a room, then you you go either on that same floor or upstairs and so on. You can you can rent a room for, for probably for many, many days. I don't know. I only spent a day there, I mean a night. Ah, this is the the chapel, and we see the cross here. You know that is so dear to Dadawando as well, although the the exterior the exterior manifestation of that cross and of the building that uh, hosts it uh, is different in the case of Tadawando. So both these buildings, Ranchamp and La Tourette, were destined for Saint Mary or for Marie. Color, no problem. Sure, nothing wrong with color. Primary color, let it be. The more, the better. Otherwise, the interior is very modest, no? I mean, this is a place not for indulging in luxuries, but for the austerities of the workings of the mind. And what is very curious here is at the end of the corridor, I hope I have images. Let's see. Uh, I have some images, but I didn't make the comment. I wanted to show you something very, very unique and uh, which puzzled me at first. Uh, it still puzzles me a little bit. Uh, let's hope. Well, you see here, these are the endings of corridors and he blocks the view towards the landscape. So there is the opening of the window, but then with a shield of concrete, which is at a certain angle, he blocks the view towards nature, towards the beautiful landscape but it is open towards the sky so i guess he wanted to force the monks to contemplate the sky and not the beauty of the landscape but this might be in contradiction with with, with what i assumed that he would say what frank loiroi said that he believes in god but he would spell it nature anyway it's very uh, uh, very i hear you see them even better but uh, it's all over also in, on this side. Uh, I hope I have other pictures with this because it's a, it's a peculiarity of this building. Yeah, you see them here. So, you know, this is, I mean, if he didn't want the monks to have any opening here, uh, I mean, no window, but he does have a window. He does have the opening of a window and then he blocks the view with a concrete uh, shield here. Very, very interesting. Um, yeah, he seems to say, you know, what you are supposed to see and reflect on is above, not a at the level of the earth. Maybe, I don't know, what, what other interpretation I could have? Anyway, uh, let's let's move back to uh, where we left it before this uh, this commentary. Yeah, we arrived here. Um, as I said, uh, uh, Yanis Xenakis had an important role in this uh, in this building, uh, and. Uh, isn't it funny in a way that here you have two architects who are not architects in the sense that they never studied architecture formally, 
Yanis Xenakis was an engineer, uh, and uh, Le Corbusier, we know, we know what he studied uh, and how he studied. And yet, we talk about them unavoidably because because they created something original, something alive, something intriguing, even something, uh, you know, controversial. Why not? It is said that good works are uh, uh, at least sometimes controversial. Maybe the the rhythm of these mullions and the partitions of the glass they were musically inspired. And here is the work of Yanis uh, uh, Xenakis, uh, the very important composer of uh, avant-garde music. Because here you see he could have uh, placed them uh, equidistant these vertical uh, elements. No, he. He uses here a rhythm, the rhythmicity is, is musical, and I don't know the technical uh, aspects of it, but I think he used uh, a certain uh, musical system or musical notation to arrive at this, you know, you would say capricious uh, uh, positioning of the, of the Malians. Now, Anish Kapoor, uh, you know, uh, an important Indian uh, artist uh, was invited to uh, uh, make a piece for uh, uh, Couvent de la Tourette. Actually, Couvent is translated technically is not quite a monastery. I, I, I tried to understand and I didn't understand. I read about it. It's very close to being a monastery, but it's, it, it's a little bit different. A, a certain technicality about it. Uh, this is the artwork that Anish Kapoor did and placed inside the church of La Tourette. Something like this would never happen in an Orthodox church, sadly. And this is not a place for the timid, you know, it's a place for uh, those who um, fight to their own limits to arrive at, uh, you know, the mystery of existence via faith. And it's, um, it's, uh, it requires order. You have to have a, a, a different conception about life. You cannot be here lukewarm water. No, you can't. You have to be as God required, either hot or cold, but not lukewarm. This architecture is not for the lukewarm people. Here you see again these uh, blocked windows by these uh, uh, shields. And yes, the entrance is through here. And here you have some services, you know, for tourists and so on. The church again the chapel on the right, the, the eating place. You see bottles there? Yes, there are. I am sure they have some containers with good wine in the cellars. And uh, the room with two uh, monks uh, debating because uh, you have, they have plenty of books and they are studious, they, uh, they, these are not uh, naive uh, uh, practitioners, uh, no, they, they uh, dedicate their life to study and reflection. It's a creation. What else can we say? And we see the composer, Yanis Xenakis, at work here. It's like there are two systems here, you know, of uh, this uh, 
this is one system and here is another system and they um, coexist. I guess that might be a painting by Victor Vasarelli. It's possible. Again, something inconceivable in an Orthodox church. In a room, in a room like this, I spent a night, just like this, with linoleum on the floor, very, very modest, but one doesn't need more. You are in a building by Le Corbusier. Some tourists. The last time I went with some students there, it was closed. Um, Anyway, I mean, close to tourists. And this so-called dirty concrete doesn't bother me at all. And I, because it's about the, the magnificence of the space and the, the, you know, the austerity of the, of the whole environment and uh, this is, again, it's not a place for uh, little uh, domestic, uh, cosmetic, uh, uh, you know, um, obsessions. No, it's for something else. This whole building was built for spirit. And spirit doesn't need, uh, you know, makeup and embellishments which in their essence are uh, deviant from truth. And you cannot arrive at truth through, you know. Although maybe some people would, uh, would debate this. I, I was ready to say you cannot arrive at truth through, uh, through makeup techniques, but uh, I don't know. What about the no theater? And you can tell the truth sometimes through its opposite somehow. It depends. Uh, maybe we can talk one day about truth and untruth in architecture. And now Saint Pierre de Firminiver is the third church that he built, uh, and this was built after he died. Uh, he left the plans and the sections and the views, the drawings. And uh, humanity built it after he died, after 1965. It's a fine church. I visited it. It is in Firmini Ver, which has other three buildings by, by him, by Le Corbusier. Unfortunately, it is unbelievably cold inside. I uh, I am not a very pretentious man, but uh, I, I it was very cold and, and I had a winter coat on me. Well, it's true, it was February, but very, very cold inside the, inside the building. And this is the building. I think it was built very well. Uh, I don't think, uh, I don't think uh, the architect who took upon himself to build this work uh, betrayed uh, Le Corbusier. I, I think Le Corbusier would have been pleased with what um, uh, these people did and this architect in particular, because it was this arch an architect, uh, I showed his a picture of him earlier, uh, took upon him to build this building. Well, this is, uh, you see here the inverted sigura, the steps towards, um, you know, they are, they are go going downwards. Saint Pierre de Firmini, where there are all kinds of these, these are uh, photoshopped uh, pictures. 
um, it took many years for the building to be built because uh, there were no funds and there were artists who contributed with their artworks to generate funds and uh, in the end it was uh, it was built you see here the the four buildings the, the cultural uh, building the cultural center the stadium uh, uh, the church and the l'unité d'habitation i love the the fluid light on the walls of of, of the church which of course uh, uh, grows from the square towards roundness as it should This is the cultural um, building, the you know the house of culture. I don't know how to call it, uh, with the graphic work in concrete done by Le Corbusier. A section through the church. This one is not dedicated to Marie or Maria any longer, but to Saint Peter. A great view because it is uh, well it is a Christian building it is a church but the constellation of lights on the surfaces of the building um, you know uh, refer to to the stars to cosmos you can take some some beautiful pictures in this building You can see the conditions of light change continuously and they are uh, disp displayed um, accordingly on the surfaces of the church. So it's almost like a, you know, a metaphor for uh, you know, the, the, the infinity of God and the, the infinity of manifestations of God. It's a little industrial town which suffered a lot from unemployment and maybe even be, be, because of war, I, I'm not sure. But it had a chance to have a mayor, Claudius Petit, who was the minister of reconstruction. And uh, Claude, Claudius Petit was a friend of Le Corbusier and appreciated him very much. So now Firmini Ver has cultural tourism because it has four buildings by Le Corbusier. Too bad it is so cold. Something must be done, but it's probably you know easily uh, solvable with this problem. There are some all kinds of. Uh, this is how at one point it looked like when they didn't. They ran out of money to build it. I am personally very moved by this collective effort to finish the work of someone who died, an important work, you know, it's, it, it shows again solidarity and it shows, uh, uh, you know, the, the power to transcend limits, both 
in space and time and uh, financial and whatever hardships he, people if they come together for a good cause they can do beautiful things they still have difficulties to stop them the mad and maddening war in ukraine but let's hope it will happen rather soon than later it is a glorious church it is it is Now you will see a few so-called artistic pictures, which are graphically, uh, you know, uh, enticing. Saint Pierre. The Firmini Ver. And this is Claudius Petit, the mayor of uh, Firmini Ver at that time, who was, as I said, the Minister of Reconstruction and a friend of Le Corbusier. Here he is. Uh, this is the man. And this is, of course, Le Corbusier. I don't know who the other two men. They are looking here at the Lunite d'Habitation, which they built. Uh, and uh, here is again uh, Claudius Petit, this time with Ronchamp. You know, it takes a few people, a few people uh, with good intentions and with the means to, to, to collaborate and to contribute and, 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 and magnificent things come into being. It really starts from the individual towards the collective. You know, uh, we need such people, inspired, generous. He was a politician but a politician with vision. He trusted Le Corbusier just as the monk Couturier trusted Le Corbusier. Uh, we saw this picture. <laughs> I love that, uh, you know, that, um, you know, chaotic uh, display of books there. This is the architect who, who, who uh, was the, the, the magician behind the uh, building the church, this, uh, this uh, work by Le Corbusier after he died. Bravo to him. He deserves truly uh, our, uh, our appreciation. And now this is a picture with two gentlemen you might not know. Well, with, with, with the one on the right, I was friends for a number of years, uh, the North American architect Lebia Suds. And the one in the, on the left, an important Austrian architect who lived and worked in New York City and died at 78 in a car accident in Los Angeles. So on the right, Lebia Suds. On the left, Raymond uh, Abraham, both staring at Saint Pierre de Firmini Ver, the building by Le Corbusier. They, they, they were both teaching at Cooper Union in uh, New York. And being friends, they chose to travel to uh, France uh, to see this uh, newly erected church. And here they are. Uh, it's a very moving uh, uh, picture, I think, because two architects, they were both over 70. Well, uh, yeah, around that time, around that. Uh, and, uh, you know, like children or like students, you know, coming to see the building of a great master that was built after he died. This is the power of art, you know? And the, it's essentially the power of love. But how else to put it? What made these men? They could have stayed home. They, they did very creative work. In fact, the, the gentleman on the left, Raymond Abraham, did the third important building in Manhattan, besides the Guggenheim Museum and the Seagram building by Miss Van der Rohe, in the opinion of Kenneth Frampton. Kenneth Frampton said that there are, you know, the three most important buildings in Manhattan 
are the Guggenheim Museum by Frank Lloyd Wright, the Seagram Building by Miss van der Rohe, and uh, the Austrian Cultural Center built by Raymond Abraham, the man on the left in this picture. And the man on the right is a very, very uh, appreciated architect. He didn't build, he built very little, but his drawings are uh, incredible. And the young architects all over the world love Levia suits. In fact, this series of presentations started on the 31st of May, 2020 on Zoom. And I invited many people, including Stephen Hall and Wolf Briggs, the assistant of Levia suits. It was his birthday and it was paying homage to Levia suits. He died in 2012. And, uh, Hard to believe there were around 250 people who attended that, that talk and that presentation on that day. Unfortunately, I was so emotional. It was my first, you know, large scale, so to speak, uh, public presentation. And until then, I only presented to doctoral students here. I forgot to activate the, the record button. I also participated with my own presentations so nothing was recorded but I do know a student who uh, took upon herself the slightly illegal uh, uh, right to record as a pirate uh, she recorded about a year uh, and one hour of that uh, of that um, presentation but uh, she refuses to give me that that recording anyway the House of Shadows, the last, this might not be considered by some or by many uh, having something to do with the subject, the Corbusier and God. But the shadow in a way comes from God because light comes from God. And this is a very strange building that Le Corbusier built in Chandigarh right in front of the most poli you know, politically charged building in Chandigarh. So how do you explain it? I, he said, he said that he built this building in order to, you know, do some, um, you know, uh, research on the, you know, on the shadows at certain times. It's hard for me to believe that that's the only reason he built this thing in front of the, you know, the, the most important political building in, in, in Chandigarh. I mean, uh, it's it's a most unusual structure, you know, and I, I don't think its purpose is exclusively, um, you know, uh, the domain of the measurable. Uh, maybe the cows that sometimes enter here uh, would agree with me, maybe more than the human beings. I, I don't know. But he needs mystery somehow, although it's possible he wanted to, you know, calculate something, you know, having to do with the shadows. But why here? You know, you see in the background the Palace of Justice, and this building is very close to the Parliament building, the most important political building or governmental building in, in Chandigarh. And you see it here, and you see it's... Uh, Just a second. I hope I have a, a different, uh, well, a, a different uh, site plan. Um, ah, this is a little bit obscure. But not everything was built, you know, was built a building. Uh, here I don't see, that's why I'm a little bit confused. I don't see the, the parliament building. The, this ramp was not built. Uh, this was built. Uh, not everything was built. The, the palace of the governor was not built. But this house of the shadows, maybe because I was born under the, the dark, dark moon, I am tempted to think that there is some, there is something having to do with, uh, with spirit here. You know, with, with um, since it has to do with light, and since light comes from the sun and from God. Uh, the shadows are related, no? And so the house of shadows must have some metaphysical function as well. Although he, he claimed that this is simply a, 
you know, uh, a factual, uh, um, you know, uh, a building uh, uh, based on, um, you know, uh, physical matters. But uh, I, I'm, I'm tempted to think that because this was a man who later in his life, uh, and this was created later in his life, uh, also was a reader of alchemy. And so you wonder, who would build something like this? You know, the house of shadow. Only Le Corbusier, it seems. I find it very interesting. And I, I like it. If I didn't know, if I didn't read anything about it, I would still like it, maybe even more, because it, it intrigues me. It's lack of, a, of a, an explicit or definite function. It's mysterious. And here she, he is with his mother, maybe the, the main, uh, what, what am I saying, maybe, the main uh, goddess in his life maybe finally acknowledging him as the, as the second good son, if not the first good son, besides the, besides the musician. That was it. So let's have a talk if you want. <laughs>